homily speaker. She and I met, we figured maybe 10, 12 years ago, we're not sure, uh, to do with the American Association of University of Women. We awarded her a certificate for her work at that time. But now I'm introducing her as the appointed Kentucky State Apiarist. I've said that right. Hoo-ha! Uh, appointed in 2014. Um, she's asked that I, did, I don't have to use her title as doctor because that's really in the area of English and she's doing her beekeeping thing now. So um, I'd like to make a few comments if I, if I might. In 2011, she uh, published a book called Bee Economy, exploring the relationship between women and bees around the world, along with the impact and potential of the female aspect intrinsic to beekeeping. She was born in Harlan County in the 1960s. I like the way it said that, though, you know? <laughs> Didn't nail it totally. Um, and I'd like to read a quote. Um, it's from the Bee Culture. Um, internet site. It says, her grandfather needed help with his beehives and not without reservation. She agreed to give it a try. You can correct this if this isn't correct. Describing her grandfather as a, quote, somewhat difficult man, she adds, his whole personality shifted while we were getting ready to go into the bees. He became more patient. His tone changed as he was talking to the bees. I had never heard this side of him before. There was a tenderness. I thought we were going to war. We were suiting up and lighting the smoker. We were planning our attack, but that wasn't what was happening that morning. As soon as we opened that first hive, I realized that I should have always kept bees. After we finished the rest of the day, I went back the next day and the next. I went back all summer. That was in 1997, and the next year will be 20 years. Tammy Horn Potter. I think the irony of my life, I had grown up on a pig farm. That was my grandfather's specialty, and I went to Berea College, determined never to do math, science, or agriculture again. Well, you see how that turned out. <laughs> now I do all three every day, and I thoroughly love it. Um, and I'm thoroughly pleased to be back um, speaking with you again. My parents met at EKU, in 1968, and uh, and so I feel uh, as if I've, I'm a, a Richmond native, whether Richmond considers me that or not. And I think when I first spoke with you a couple of years ago, I had just been named the state apiarist, and boy, there's been a lot of water that's passed under the bridge, and I wanted to, to just make you aware, because I know that many people uh, you may not be beekeepers, and you may not have apiaries, but you may have um, monarch way stations. You may have hummingbirds, uh, hummingbird feeders. You may have other pollinators that you care about in your gardens. So I kind of wanted to keep you in on the loop on some of the things that Kentucky Department of Ag is doing to help protect these. Uh, in 2015, uh, some of you may recall that President Obama had issued a pollinator protection initiative. And the primary goal of that was it was aimed at what we call the managed pollinator people, the beekeepers, um, because we, have, we tend to have a little bit more control. Um, but the goal of that plan was to reduce hive deaths down to 15% by the year 2025. Uh, currently, Kentucky has had losses of our honeybee colonies. 40% last year was down to 33%. And we're, we're, we're making headway, I think. Uh, but 
and it, but this is just the honeybees that we know about. Uh, we know that we also have losses in the bumblebee species. One has just been named this year as an endangered species. So, um, you know, uh, it's it's timely in part because so much of our food depends upon pollinators. If you like tomatoes, then you like bumbles. They that fruit does not exist without bumblebee buzz pollination, they call it. If you like watermelons, you need pollinators. Almonds, you need pollinators. Citrus, you know, um, there most many of our fruits and vegetables have to have some type of pollination. And, uh, and then for those of you who like wildflowers, 70% of those species have to have some type of pollination. Um, the plants are generally rooted to the ground. They cannot go out and reproduce themselves the way that we can when we decide we're looking for a mate and we want to go to a bar or a church or wherever it is that we happen to run across somebody <laughs> special. So the, bee, uh, the plants need bees. Uh, that the two evolved together, you know, 30 million years ago. So this is an ancient, I like to quote from the Disney movie Wings of Life. This is an ancient love story. Many, much more ancient than what we ever give it credit for. So in 2015, um, other states had already started their pollinator protection plans. Kentucky was coming to it relatively late in the ball game. But we made a decision immediately to not just focus on managed pollinators such as the, the honeybees, but to include the other threatened species as well. So our plan uh, made, uh, we dropped the word managed pollinator protection plan. It's strictly pollinator protection plan. We reached out immediately to other stakeholders. Uh, this is a short list now. Columbia Natural Gas has just signed on. Um, and other, uh, you know, we reached out to the Central Kentucky Audubon Society uh, because we wanted their input in our plan. Um, the photo from the previous slide is actually from the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. They have taken some of their rest areas out of service, you may have noticed, and converted those to pollinator uh, habitat stations. Um, so, you know, we've been working, and we were able this year, finally, November the 15th, this is how new this is. We were able to get our electronic communication tool, it's an app, up and running at the Kentucky Department of Ag. So if people have, um, you know, orchards that they need to spray, but the, but the product label requires communication with beekeepers, they can actually use this app uh, and notify area beekeepers. Now, why am I telling you this? Like I said, I know many of you don't have apiaries, but you can use this app. Um, you would have to register yourself as a beekeeper, which if you have a backyard, you're keeping bees whether you like it or not. <laughs> you know, you've got them. And so register yourself as a beekeeper and you can use it. And then if you also have orchards, or if you have, um, you know, areas, uh, may, maybe some of you uh, are soybean growers or corn growers or things like this, I really wanted to encourage you to use it too, you would register as an applicator. And this is free to you, it is free to anyone, and, it, and there's a degree of anonymity in this too. Uh, the beekeepers didn't want for people to see where their hives are. Uh, and the applicators that we talked to, that we had at the table, didn't necessarily want their names being put out there. So it's anonymous in the sense that when an applicator, we'll get into this here, I'll show you the process, um, but there's, it's anonymous, it's free, and we made an attempt to make it simple to use. So um, having said that, um, my primary challenge as a state apiarist, I know some people don't realize what I do or what the, what the position of apiarist is. Kentucky has one apiarist, Florida has 13. Uh, just to give you a sense, Missouri has no apiarists. Um, so it really does differ by the state. 
but my primary challenge is to is to is to help beekeepers understand that they have to control this parasite. This is a varroa mite, and I brought some varroa mites for people to see because I think sometimes we hear a lot about this in the news. Uh, and if you give me just a second, I'll unscrew the cap here and pass this around. I'm sorry. No, they're in. So that container should never ever have more than nine of those red dots in there. And in the month of September, I would quit counting at 40. Um, but, but this is my primary challenge. In part, these mites live on the body of the bee, of course, compromising them physically. But then the other thing that they do is they, they transfer viruses to honeybees. And these are two of the most easily visible and recognized of the viruses. One is called the deformed wing virus, which is just what it sounds like. The honeybees will emerge from their cells with their wings compromised. Obviously, they're not able to fly to, to, to get pollen or nectar. They're not able to, you know, bees this time of year are keeping themselves warm at 92 degrees in their hive. The way that they do that is to use their wings. Um, so they can't do the most basic functions inside the hive. The other type of easily visible uh, virus is the Israeli acute bee paralysis virus. And many people, beekeepers I should say, don't realize that what they're seeing here is that their hives have a virus. Uh, this particular virus is really detrimental to the colony because it causes the bees to lose their hair. And you may not have thought about this, but the, the fuzz on a bee is absolutely critical to the health of a colony, in part for a couple of different reasons. Um, again, this time of year, they're staying warm in winter cluster at 92 degrees. That hair keeps them that way. It is not unusual for a hive that is severely compromised with this virus to freeze to death in the middle of summertime. It simply can't do the thermal regulation that uh, a healthy colony needs to do. The other thing that many people don't realize until you see bees under a microscope, they have hair everywhere. They have hair on their eyes, on their tongue. Their legs have different types of hair. Uh, in other words, their, their, their legs are kind of like a man's hairbrush with very short bristles so it can, can scrape the pollen off that it's collecting. But the body of a bee will have very long, wavy hair because as it's flying, it's collecting pollen through the air currents. So it's an amazing, even the tongue, the proboscis is what we call it, even the tongue of a bee has hair on it. Every single aspect of the bee has evolved in some form or fashion to collect nutrition as it's flying through the air and hold on to that nutrition until they get it inside the hive. So when a virus impacts a bee and, it's a bit in, and causes it to lose its hair, it's really a critical health issue. Um, and so one of the issues that I have to do constantly when I'm talking to beekeepers is to urge them to get these mites off of the bees. These viruses have been around millions of years. What's new is the vector. What's new is how the honeybees get these viruses. And so that's my primary job. We have a grant to help teach beekeepers how to do this. Many of you know me as a grant writer. Uh, this is easily the least amount of money. It is easily the most difficult <laughs> grant I have to deal with because any USDA grant is a pain in the neck to deal with. It is probably the most important grant I've ever written because it gives us a baseline data of bee health that previous, previously we have not had anything you know, across the board. What does that mean? So my territory is 120 counties. And using this grant, 
I am able to take six samples from each of these districts and I send them into uh, the USDA in, in DC. And what I do is I have a sample box here just because I, I, thought, I know that this congregation is highly intelligent. I know that many of you um, are, are com you know, academics, you're leaders of the community, and so I thought that there may be some folks that are interested in how we do this. So I'll take, I'll take 150 bees and I'll put them in this alcohol jar from eight different colonies and then I'll take another 150 bees and we'll put them in this ventilated box. And it has a sugar, has a sugar plate down in the bottom so that those bees stay alive while they're in transit and then there's also a water tube. And that keeps them hydrated. And then when I close these up and I take them to the post office, of course, I go to immediately the front of the line. No one wants to be behind. No one wants to be around me. You know, they hear these bees buzzing and, and I just shoot right to the front. We get these bees sent. And, they, and then these get dropped in a scientific freezer at 100, I mean, at 80 degrees below zero. And then the researchers pull the RNA uh, virus titers out. That's how that works. The other thing that this particular grant pays me to do is to take beeswax samples. Beeswax is the lungs of the beehive. And anytime, you remember I told you about how these bees have lots of hair? Uh, anytime they're bringing back pollen and other things into the hive, um, you know, that beeswax and the pollen end up absorbing whatever the bees bring back. So <clears throat> 2016, uh, I took 10 samples of pollen, uh, each sample costing approximately $300. And, and the, of course, it was analyzed for the different chemicals that the bees would be bringing back. This is critical. The, the role of chemicals in hives has been a volatile subject. And this is our first look at what's going on in, in terms of chemicals, you know, what's happening inside the beehive, what they're bringing back. Uh, of the 10 samples, three showed absolutely no chemicals whatsoever, none. none. Um, the other, the rest of these, we're not going to go through here. I realize I see some looks like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we've turned into this chemistry class. But, but what I walked away from um, is I, I walked away from this again, thinking that A, chemical usage is still serious, especially, especially with issues of drift, you know? I mean, whenever you go out to your garden and you're spraying something, you ne can't necessarily control that it, you know, stays right there in your garden. Um, but of all of these, there are only two that cause me major concern, major, like, like I really worry. And that one is, it starts with a C, about halfway down called cloth uh, That's the, that's of all of these, that's the ultra toxic one, where the product label clearly says beekeepers need five days of warning in advance. And ultimately what they would like is for the beekeeper to move those bees. Um, so, you know, t three of our samples, um, had clothianidin in their, in their pollen. Uh, one was trace amount, so you can live with that because this is a fairly common uh, product used on corn, primarily. Um, the other two showed, showed uh, some, you know, it would be nice if those, if those applicators could, could contact these beekeepers. But everything else, you know, I can live with two of these, of course, a beekeeper applied miticides to get those mites off the bees. Um, and we've been approved, I've been taking samples for the 2017 year, uh, so we'll add to this. Next year will look different, that's because that's the nature of agriculture. And then I passed around um, the results from the 2016 year, just to kind of show you, um, again, just to give you a baseline data of bee health, honey bee health in the, in the, the state of Kentucky. Uh, the, the critical columns I would call your attention to um, are 
I think Mr. Robert gave me a pointer here, but I don't have it in my hand. But basically, if you're looking at the bottom columns, um, we start with mites present, that's 96%. Can't do anything about that, right? We, this is, all of the hives are gonna have varroa mites. That's just, the, that's the new normal here. But the second one, I'll call your attention to, the, the, the apiaries that have really exceptionally high mite counts, that has dropped from last year. We've gone from 46% down to 29%. My goal for 2017, get that down even lower, right? The lower that goes, the more easier it is for us to meet that um, goal by 2025 to have our losses reduced down to 15%. And then the viruses are in the purple and the blue. And any time, like I said now, if, if an apiary has mites, which they're going to do, they're going to have a virus. And so this, like I said, what you have in your hands right now is baseline data for bee health in our state. Um, and then, and I'll get to this here in a second, but I put out a newsletter and I published this in the newsletter so that people can see this. And, I'll, and I have a brochure here if somebody wants to distribute these, my email and contact information and online site where you can download the newsletters, that's all in this brochure. Okay, we talked about this pollinator protection app. There are some ag chemicals that are so toxic that the label requires communication, right? But we have not in this state had a way of notifying people. There's a gap there. So this app meets that gap. I'm not trying to be a poet, but it is anonymous. Like I said, it's free to, for people to use. And we've really opened it up here. I mean, specialty crop growers can use this. Um, like I said, if you, if you are working on man uh, monarch protection plans, register yourself as a beekeeper and you should be able to use this. If you are a farmer and you have an orchard and you want to use this to notify your neighbors that you're going to be applying a product that the label says, hey, let your, let your beekeeper friends know about this, you're welcome to use this. We're utility companies may use this, right? We want as many people to use this app as possible. Okay. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And uh, we've set it up for two sets of users. One set is the beekeepers, and like I said, anybody else who wants to consider themselves a beekeeper. And the other side is for applicators, but we're using the same map in both sets. Um, you'd have to get register once. You want to make sure to use Chrome. It doesn't seem to work well with Internet Explorer. I don't know why. Um, but you would put your apiary or your sensitive area, whatever, if it's a Monarch Way station, in a box like that, click finish, and then it's stored. And no one, I don't get to see this unless there's a problem, okay? Uh, you can modify an existing hive. Uh, this is especially attractive for our beekeepers who move their bees out of state. You know, they don't keep their bee yards here all the time. They can take a yard off. And then if, you know, there is a product that is applied in their area, that person will get, a, will get an email saying basically, okay, on this date, at this time, this is going to be applied. Please take appropriate measures to protect your areas. We don't tell you what to do. We don't tell you anything more than that. We just want to give you a heads up. Again, applicators have the same kinds of, uh, they can put on a map where they will be applying something, if it's an orchard, if it's a farm, you know, if it's a utility right of way, you know, they can put on this map here, we're going to be applying an herbicide on this day at this time, right? And then once they click finish, the emails from the affected beekeepers will come up. And so the the applicator never sees the beehives. That was really important to our beekeepers. And then the applicator gets an email, thank you very much for using this service. Please print off this record in case there are any problems. 
And we've got a paper trail, you know, so that if somebody goes out and starts spraying when the wind is blowing in, you know, Hurricane Irma-like conditions, you know, then there's something there that we can fall back on. We don't like to issue citations, but unfortunately we do have deaths to pollinators because people are determined to, to spray an apple orchard before the rain comes and, um, you know, and we do. Uh, our department does, you know, it's, like I said, it's not our favorite part of the job, but, um, you know, that's, that's what we get paid to do is monitor those things. And so I mentioned the newsletter that I put out. This is the way that I communicate with most of the people who are interested in pollinator issues. If you would like to have uh, a copy of the results from 2016, that's in the November issue. Um, we just put out the December issue, which has a fuller description of the ag chemicals found in the pollen analysis. And you're welcome to simply email me at tammy.potter at ky.gov and I'll put you on that distribution list. But the other things that I also do, I'm also involved with other grants um, that are not as much of a pain in the neck to, to execute, fortunately. <laughs> and so um, one of the grants is to, is to work with kids and, and have them do more with honey, uh, less, less work on, on in the beehives, but just an awareness, a increasing awareness of the products of the hive, like beeswax. Many of us this time of year need lip balm because our lips get chapped when there's changing temperatures, um, and also honey, and many of our uh, bakery, holiday bakery get, uh, goods. Working with uh, Green Forest Works, uh, uh, we just received um, a major uh, multi-million, $8 million grant to uh, get pollinator habitat, primarily aimed at cerulean warblers. But as it turns out, a lot of the habitat for cerulean warblers is also good for honeybees. That the, these are trees that are producing nectar and pollen. And so Kentucky, out of the five states that got this $8 million grant, Kentucky is the only one that that brought me into the mix, into the program, uh, to work on forest-based beekeeping. Um, and then finally, um, because of, um, you know, like I said, I realize most of you don't have apiaries, but a critical part of bee health is having, is having really healthy queen bees. And this year was our very first year uh, for the Queen Bee Breeders Association. Uh, we're working at getting that uh, crucial element to be health established. Now, I did want to share with you uh, two other types of bee habitat. So I'm going to put this down. I'll be right back. Again, the the pollinator protection plan, we're, we're concerned about all pollinators. So I like to call attention to the mason beehive. This is easily, to me, the, the easy, you know, for, I'm smitten with mason bees. I'm absolutely just charmed by these. These are solitary bees. They are not honey producers. Um, so A, they don't, def they don't have a stinger. There's no need to defend themselves. And this is an early spring bee. For those of you who like strawberries, you like apples, you like cherries, you like peaches, this is your bee, right? Uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, the other name for a mason bee is the blue orchard bee. Because underneath a microscope, it is the most beautiful sapphire blue that you have ever seen. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and what happens is that the female lays her eggs at the very back of the tube, female eggs, and then she lays her male eggs up at the front, and then she closes that tube off. She has left a little ball of pollen with each egg. She closes it off with a kind of a mud, uh, a caulk, and that's where the name Mason comes from. Um, and then she dies outside the tube. That's it, her life cycle is done. So by the 1st of June, mason bees have done their thing. And if you, these make really good gifts, right? I realize we're well into the holiday season here. Um, and this is approximately $20. Uh, 
Um, I'm not getting any kickbacks on this. I just like to make people aware of this. And if you want to, to really um, take advantage of this, you need to get this out by the first, uh, I would say about the, about the middle week of February. Uh, because they, the drones, the males start coming out that last week of February. The females take a little longer to mature. One of my third graders said, women always take longer to mature. <laughs> they always take longer to come out. <laughs> but they may, and by, by March, those females then are looking for a place to lay. So, so and it takes approximately, you know, they need food. Right? They need food and habitat just like any living critter. So um, you need to make sure that you have strawberries and, and things that they can um, get nectar and pollen from. The other thing I like to call people's attention to, um, if you like your cucumbers and your pumpkin, pumpkins and other things, um, your late summer vegetables, squash, things like that, this is a bumblebee colony, right? And, you know, this time of year, uh, the colony is not a colony the way that we think of it. It is a queen, right? She has in her insect body a liquid that acts as antifreeze. And, uh, and her workers have created this ti these tiny little pots of honey. They're no bigger than the end of my finger, my nail on my pinky finger, these little pots of honey. Um, and that's what she subsists, subsists on until the, until the plants start blooming in February, when we have those warm days. Then she, when pollen starts coming in, the days start getting longer, she will start laying daughters again. Uh, but at the most, in the middle of summer, this colony will never be more than, say, 200 bees. And the secret to luring a bumblebee colony, because they prefer to live in the ground, is to find mouse nests soaked with mouse urine. Just run right out there to Walmart and buy some. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Those are your stocking stuffers. I have a barn, so I have a ton of them. This is easy for me. Um, but that's a trick that I learned from an old British beekeeping book, bumblebee book, back like 1901, 1902 kind of thing. Only time I have ever been successful at luring a bumblebee colony into a bumblebee hive. But I like to show people, you know, that there's a seasonality to bees. And having said that, here is my contact information. You have my brochure. Um, you know, I'm not sure where I am on time, but, um, and I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Okay, all right. You, you, you tell me. It's your, it's your service. Okay, I saw your. On a sh okay, so the question. Where do you hang the mason bee? Uh, hive. So I hang it on a shepherd's crook right in the middle of my strawberry patch and I now have these things are so old that I mean like 10 years old that this has rotted off and so then I take the whole collection of tubes and I put it on my front picture window seal you know and just because now the bees know where they are you know they know where these tubes are and, and by and it takes, like the first year, maybe 25% of this will, will be occupied. You know, it takes them two to three years but for it to be fully 100% occupied. But it's really, it's wonderful to see because, you know, the bumbles try to get in and their big butts can't get in. You know, they'll, you'll see the bumbles trying to build there and they can't do it. It's, it's How many per, uh, we've got, We've got about two to three acres of land that we care oh, for. Oh, you you could put as many as you wanted to out here okay. and, and on the shepherd's crook. Yeah, yeah, that's all I need to know. Yeah. Thanks. I think her hand was up next. That's the one I saw next, anyway. Uh, okay, carpenter bees are a different species of bee, and 
and they are destructive. Now, these bees will take advantage of the holes that wood carpenter bees bore, but these bees do not bore. They do not have those mandibles that a wood carpenter bee has to do that. So they're not the same bee. My concern is, in trying to get rid of carpenter bees, are they using things that will kill other bees? Yes. So where do we go for Apply it at night. Apply it at night. That's the easiest way to, to kind of mitigate damages. So the question is, okay, so you need to use products to kill wood carpenter bees. How do you do that without impacting other pollinators? One is, is soapy water sprayed, you know, with the percentage of 3% soap and, and this aerial spray. You can, you can use that, and that's a relatively safe for you and your pets and your children and everything else, so soapy water, um, it impacts their respiratory system. You know, soapy water does. Uh, but you have to spray it uh, for it to be effective. So that's a safe one. And then your other products, if you're going to use a, a commercially made product, you, the best way to minimize impact is to apply it at night, preferably after 6 or 7 o'clock when everything else is inside. Yeah. We have one more, and, and then the rest uh, Several of us have uh, Monarch Way stations. Sure. How do they fit in with the pollinator program? Well, uh, as I said, uh, um, we, f we feel like they're critical. We've had, uh, we've had wild ones at the table uh, from the moment we began our stakeholder meetings. Um, we've had Garden Club at Kentucky have their leadership at the table. And so if you want to use this app, you would register yourself as a beekeeper, but we just, Monarch Way Station managers can use this. That's why I'm telling you about it, because I know that there's a lot of people who have them, especially in Richmond. You have an active garden club here. So that's, you know, if we can get the, if we can get the word out, yeah. The more users we have, the easier it is for me to justify to the commissioner that we need to continue to support this program. It's not, compared to other ag programs, a, a, a hugely expensive app, but it does cost some money. And so the, the more I can, like I said, the more users, the more easily it is for me to justify. Thank you. Thank you.